Okay, <coughs> marvellous. I'm going to share my screen. So I might flip between the presentation and things at, at, at times, Ren, as well. So because we've done um, a keyword and a competitor audit for you, I'll, I'll, I will run through that quickly, probably at the end, but I might flip between bits as well so you can see in context of, of what I'm talking about here, like what, what we've done on the, um, on, yeah. the, on the things. So, so we're doing SEO basics today. So what we're gonna look at is, what is a search engine algorithm and what do they, how do they work and what do they want from you? Because for me, I have to understand the whole of something before I can understand my part of something. And I think if you understand how an algorithm works and what how a search engine works and what it wants from you, it's much easier then to create the, the website that they're looking for from you. Um, I know you're going to be starting rebuilding your website soon, aren't you? So this is the stuff that's going to come in handy for once, either once it's live or just before it goes live. Um, and if you're writing any content and all the rest of it. We'll look at how do you choose keywords and where do you find them um, and how do you optimize a web page or blog. Now, that bit, uh, I, I will sort of, I've got two um, uh, like uh, resources, a, a Word document and an infographic that I will send you afterwards, but go through all of that bit about optimizing a web page or a blog. So don't feel that you have to remember it all in this session. We also go over that bit when we're doing the better blogging course. So when we're looking at how do you specifically write a blog and upload it and optimize it and stuff, you'll get a refresher on that. So don't feel like you have to remember every bit of that. It's not massively complicated. There are only a handful of things, but you know, I, I'm not expecting you to remember it yeah. first time around. So that's that's... Fine. Okay, so first of all, what is a search engine algorithm? So a search engine algorithm is a, a phenomenally complex thing um, and also a phenomenally simple thing. So there are hundreds of thousands of factors as to as to what go into how a search engine works and, and how it chooses which website is best and blah, blah, blah. But at its heart, it's only got some very simple ways of understanding what we're doing. You know, it's a computer algorithm at the end of the day. It's only ever as good as the human beings that have built it. Uh, and it's only as good as the people who put content into the internet in the first place. Um, so when we think of it, you know, strip it back to its absolute basics, you have a search engine algorithm. And throughout this, I'll probably talk about Google purely because they've got the biggest market share. Um, but when I say search engine algorithms, I also mean Bing and I mean Yahoo and I mean DuckDuckGo. Roughly speaking, all of those algorithms work in fairly similar ways. So there's actually not a lot of difference between them. But you have the search engine. It has what it calls a bot. So the Google has the Google bot, Bing has the Bing bot. And the bot goes along all across the internet all the time, crawling web pages. And essentially it is reading the content that is on your web page. And then it puts it in what it thinks is the most appropriate place based on what it thinks you're talking about. Now that bot is quite clever. And it will understand the vast majority of what you're talking about. If you've got some text, obviously it can read your text. So it knows what you're talking about. If you've got an image, it can sort of tell what that image is some of the time. But the optimization piece that we do is, is just belt and braces to make sure we're telling that bot at the time that it crawls that page, this is what this page is about. This is who I want you to show it to. This is the keyword. So this is the title. This is what we're talking about. So that there's no ambiguity. So it's got no excuse for not understanding what, we, what we're trying to tell it. So it'll crawl it. It will then go and put it, as I say, in the most appropriate place. Somebody then comes along and puts a search query into the search engine and the, the Google bot goes, okay, I know where that content is for that thing. I can go straight to it and I can find it really quickly. And it then returns it in the search results. And as you see, if you ever look at the top when you're doing a search result, you could have like 6 billion potential search results found in not not three seconds. So all of that, it does phenomenally quickly and it takes an awful lot of processing power. But that's basically it. Essentially, a search engine is a, is a massive filing cabinet and it's just the internet's filing cabinet. So, you know, as you say, if we, if we were thinking of it in terms of a, an old fashioned filing cabinet, if you put something in to the filing cabinet and you haven't labeled it properly and you haven't put it in the right drawer or the right file, next time you come to find it, it's not there. It's not where you thought it was. If you put the bank statement in with the mortgages and you're looking in the bank statement file and it's not there. So you either go back and you print out another one or you give up or you find the next best thing or whatever. Same thing with a search engine. 
if we don't tell it, if it doesn't put it in that right place at the beginning, when somebody puts the search query in and it goes to in the place that it thinks those should be to look for it and it's not there, that's when your, you know, somebody else's content will be there, somebody else's website will come up, somebody else will get returned, and yours eventually just gets further and further down the pile and it falls down the back of the drawers and it ends up at the bottom and it's never found again. And that's how a search engine works. So we upload the content, the bots come and crawl it, the bots index it, and that's what we talk about. We talk about a search engine index. That's when they're, they're putting it essentially into that filing cabinet. If a, if, a, if a search engine hasn't indexed your web pages or your website, it doesn't mean that they're not there. They're still there on the internet. And as long as you keep paying your hosting, they will always be there on the internet. It's just that they're not in the search engine index. So when somebody comes along and searches, you won't show up. If they type in your direct name, they'll probably find you because you're there, but you're not in the index. The bots will then, uh, sorry, somebody then comes in, types a query, bots will search through the index. And as I say, they'll go to the place that they think is most appropriate and they then return the best answer. And we'll come back to what it deems is the best answer. So Google indexes 35 trillion web pages at all times. And I mean, there's just some phenomenal numbers there. You know, the, the digital universe is enormous. And if you think we've since the, early 90s we've all been uploading pages and pages and pages to the internet it is massive it's bigger than we can even imagine it being the amount of energy that it takes to run that is phenomenal so google and other search engines they're, they're chopping down forests and commandeering fields and they're building massive warehouses and then they've got to house the, all the servers in those warehouses and then they've got to have the electricity that runs those servers and then they've got to keep all servers cool so they're running fans all the time so that's even more electricity and there's so much carbon dioxide coming off that so environmentally there's a huge cost to running a search engine and just in simple terms of money and energy and all the rest of it it's phenomenal and it's getting bigger and so what the search engines are going to start doing whereas once upon a time if you put your website onto the internet and they said um, you know, okay, you, you, you've got a website, we'll index it, we'll help somebody find it. Now what they're going to start doing is saying, well, if you actually don't have a good reason for us to keep that piece of content in our index, we're not going to, because you've got to prove that it deserves to be there because the cost of just keeping every crappy website from 2014 in there is, is too much. And so what they're going to start doing is looking at things like, well, does it add value? Is it, is it a good piece of content? Does it answer people's questions? And I will come back to all of this. Um, does it, you know, is that business still in operation? So if you've had a website since 2010 and you haven't updated it, Google doesn't know that your business didn't go out of business in 2011. So it'll go, well, you haven't updated that for however many years, nearly 10 years. We're not going to keep it in our index. As I said, it's still there on the internet. If somebody types in your name or that web address or whatever, they will find it but it's not going to appear in people's search results. And so what we're thinking of now in terms of sort of SEO is, whereas, as I say, once upon a time, you built your website, you put it live, you left it, people would naturally find it. That's not going to happen now. You've got to prove that you deserve to be there. And that means adding fresh content and it means updating it and it means asking and answer queries and all the things that I'm going to talk to you about in a minute. So you've got to prove that you deserve to be in that index, otherwise you won't be. So when we think about how do we use search engines, so three, three and a half billion searches are carried out by, uh, carried out by search engines every day. That's more now because it's done two years ago. So that'll be a lot more. Um, Google has a 92% share of the market. It had a 97% share of the market and it's gone down recently. And the reason for that is that Bing, um, if you have an Alexa device, Alexa defaults to Bing. So because a lot more searches are now being done by voice and, and you know, Alexa's are becoming more popular, Bing has, has slightly taken that market share. But realistically, Google's going to have to do something massively wrong. It's dominated this market since 1998. So it's going to have to do something phenomenally poor if it's going to stop having a market share that's that massive. You know, search engines have come and gone and tried to challenge and they cannot get anywhere near Google because Google spends a lot of money on making sure it's good, basically. And I mean, the thing is now with Google, if you do a search on Google and it doesn't give you the answer you were expecting, you notice that because it's such a, a rare thing that happens that you have to then go and do another search. So it's good. It's really good at what it does. And, and that's why it dominates. 
It moved to mobile first indexing um, a couple of years ago. And that means that it now assumes that most people will access their, their website on their mobile phones. So if your website is only set up to work on a desktop and it doesn't shrink, it's not responsive, it doesn't do all the things we need a mobile website to do, it, Google won't deem it worthy because if, you, if you're accessing it on a, on a mobile, you get a poor search result, you think Google's rubbish, you're going to go to things. So you damage them. So they just won't now, you know, your, your website has to work mobile first or it won't even consider it. And this is all the bot work, right? This is all what, sorry? This is all the bots doing this, like checking if, if how does Google know if a website is good on a mobile phone or not? Is it the bot? Yes. That, yeah, that exactly. Figure it out, yeah. Right. Figure it out, yeah. It's all in the code, so Amazing. it's in the back end of the website. <laughs> okay. Uh, all of the information that, that we don't see from the front end that's in the back end, which is the bit that the bots read, they tell it all of that information and they, they tell it all of the things that we put in those little boxes when we're updating our website. That's the information that we're giving it. And so, yeah, they can see quite quickly, is it going to work on a mobile? Have they got meta descriptions in it? Have they got, uh, you know, told us what this image is, all the rest of it. Or okay. I, and, I, and I will explain all of these, but yeah, it's the box. Okay. And this is what I mean, they're, they're phenomenally powerful. They will work this out. They go and crawl your website and in milliseconds, they've got the answers to that that they need and they will then rank you according to where they think you deserve to be ranked. And they do that like that. So the power okay. behind them is, is amazing. But, but yeah, 60% of all searches are voice activated now. And that's, that's expected to rise. So we're all using Alexas and you know, using Siri on our phones and what have you. Um, the, the reason that that makes a difference is because when we were typing things in, we tend to type one or two words uh, into our search engines, maybe sometimes you know, three or four, but very rarely will we type a full sentence in as a search query. Whereas when we're speaking into our phones or shouting at our Alexas, we will ask questions semantically. So we will ask full sentences and we will also um, use what they call, so it's not direct language either. So for example, if we want to know, you know, is it rain, is it going to rain tomorrow? If we were doing that as a typed search into our browser, we might say rain, bake up Thursday and, and get the weather forecast. If we're shouting it at the Alexa, we might go, Alexa, am I going to need a brolly tomorrow? And we're expecting Alexa to know where we are what day it is now, so that it can work out what day tomorrow is, that a brolly means umbrella, which means rain. So we're expecting it to understand, you know, um, colloquial language and all the rest of it. So it's, again, they're very good. They're, they're very good at understanding the nuance of what we're actually asking, but it's changed how search has worked. And it means that when we're creating content and we're creating blogs and we're asking and answering questions, and again, all the things I'm gonna to talk to you about, um, we have to think about that. We have to think about how is somebody going to ask this question rather than just put in the one or two words that they're directly looking for. So how does how does Google choose number one? So as I said before, there are a, a few hundred, if not a few thousand, um, ranking factors that it will use, and it and it comes to down to like minute things like have you done this or have you done, are you mobile first? You know, have you got some schema markup, all these complicated things that it'll, that it'll look at. But essentially, the very basic way in which it judges whether or not a website is good hasn't changed for 30 years because it is that essential stuff of, have they updated it regularly? Because otherwise, how do we know that they're still in business? You know, does it work when people are on it? Are they asking and answering questions that people are gonna ask? So it looks at all of these things like, you know, is it, is it well used? Are lots of people already using it? If so, that indicates it's probably a good website. Are they staying? Are they browsing? Are they coming back time and time again? So if you're not adding any fresh content, you're not giving anybody a reason to come back. So they're not gonna come back. So again, you, you, you're immediately giving off those indications that this site is just a plain business card, brochure site, it's not really adding value to anybody. And the other thing it will look at is, is the site a trusted source? And the way that it does this is through backlinks. And we, we will come on to backlinks and talk about them in detail. But essentially, backlinks are like recommendations from other people's websites to yours. So it's somebody on, on another website saying, the content on this website has value. And I recommend you go over there and have a read of it. And I'm going to link to it to, to enable you to do that. And the more of those you have, the more your website is seen as trusted and, and worthy and it's got some good content on there and all the rest of it. So those links, once upon a time, again, a website just 
existed by itself, it just hung by itself. And nowadays that's not enough. You've got to prove that you operate within an ecosystem and your business doesn't just hang by itself and that your suppliers and your customers and other people in your industry and everybody else is linking into you. And that proves that you are a worthy website. So how do we know that these are the things that Google is looking for? So Google never tell us what exactly their ranking factors are. Um, which means that Google has this, this spokesman, John Mueller, who goes on Twitter every now and again. Everyone on Twitter, all the SEO people, spend hours talking about, I think Google is using this because this happened to my website. I think they're doing this. And John Mueller will then just drop into the conversation and go, no, we don't do that. We've never done that. And it blows everybody up. So, But they never tell us what they do do. Um, but when you go into your Google Analytics or any of your analytics platforms in the back end of your website, and you look at the metrics, these are the first set of metrics it gives you. And it's asking how many people are coming onto the website? How many pages are they looking at when they get there? So are they browsing? How long are they spending on the website? And are they coming back to the website? Are they returning visitors? So we know that these are the things that it is looking for. Again, is the website a resource? So back to the thing of, if you've only got one or two pages, there aren't, there isn't a lot of places that people can browse from and to. They're not going to click through and click through and click through. So you're not giving people pages to browse through. If you haven't got much content and you've only got like a picture and a little bit of text and there's no videos and there's no pictures and there's no gallery and there's no blogs to read or anything else, they're not going to stay long because there's nothing to keep your interest. So your average session will go down. And then again, if you're not putting fresh content on there, they've got absolutely no reason to come back once they've visited it once. They might come, they've got your phone number, they're not coming back. So you're not going to get those returning visitors. So back to the uh, basics. Rachel, can I just yeah. ask you, sorry. Um, I Because a few things are going through my mind about my website, obviously, as you're talking. Are you going to come to my website in this session? And, and uh, Because I know you've done an audit. Are you going to talk about recommendations in this session? Uh, I am a little bit, but given the fact that you are having the website rebuilt, I haven't done a massive critique of the website as it currently is. I've, I've done I've done a bit of a critique and some recommendations in the audit of what we need to do going forward. But what I thought would be more useful is if we do the grounding today and then when you're actually coming to plan your new website, then we'll go through it page by page and make sure we've got a good site structure, a good page structure, we've got the click throughs and all the rest of it. So I think it'd be a bit overwhelming if we do the actual planning bit today. Is that all right? Okay, so basically, and so I'd have to sort of uh, book it as a separate session. No, we're going to do it in the next one. Whenever the next one's booked in, I think that's. Oh, we can do in. next in yeah. the next one. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm yeah. just because I've got. Uh, I think. By the end of this month, I've got my first meeting with uh, the developer. And so I just wanted to have a, a because he's got to quote me as well, obviously, in principle, I've agreed. But uh, and so I wanted to, to show him what I was thinking. Yeah. And I mean, the, so the thing is, when you um, when and I've done some I've done the competitor analysis for, for your website. So you can have a look at some of the websites that you're gonna be up against. But what you'll see when you look at the keywords that you want to target and who is currently ranking, you will see that they have got a lot of pages, a lot of content, they've got videos, they've got say galleries, they've got blogs, a lot of them have got other things like um, downloadable guides and PDFs and all sorts of things, the, the big websites. Obviously, you're not gonna achieve that straight yeah. out of the barrel. The first sure. thing you've gotta do is get the website live. And so, because adding content is an important part of it, it's always better to launch with the sort of bare minimum that you need to fulfill the buyer journey and stuff, which we'll come on to. But um, you want somewhere to go. So, so I think what, what we need to do really is get, get you a basic sitemap. And actually the sitemap you've got now is absolutely fine. There's nothing wrong with it. Rebuild what you've got and then start to look at, okay, how do, what pages are we going to add next? How are we going to fill in that buyer journey? How are we going to make sure we've got calls to action and all the rest of it? So we'll, we will come to it definitely. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, so what do search engines want from you? So as I said before, a search engine is only ever as good as the content it puts out there. So Google is the, the search engine that most of us use. So we go to Google and we say, I want information on such as such they on, on how to make a cake. If that website that Google gives us is rubbish, we think, oh, Google's crap. I'm going to go and try Bing and see what Bing gives me. So it is, it's, its reputation is entirely reliant 
on the people who are creating content and putting up, but it has no control over that. So it, it can't tell people what it needs to do. It doesn't create content itself, but it does a bit, but not massively. Um, so it's reliant on us. So it's important that we understand what, what are they looking for from us so that we can fulfill that when we're creating our content. So the first thing it wants to do is it wants us to ask questions. So again, what do we do with search engines? We ask it questions, that's all we've ever done. We go to our search engines, whether we're typing it, whether we're speaking it, whether we're screaming it in the car or in our bedrooms, whatever, we are asking questions. And there might be a whole series of questions. They might start really mundane, they might go deeper. We might be asking really obscure things, but it's always a question that we're asking. So Google needs us to answer those questions. So when we are thinking about what do we put on our website? What do we put in our blogs? How do we create content? We always need to be asking and answering the questions that our customers are likely to be asking. The other thing to remember with this is that Google knows, thanks to big data, not just the question that you ask now, it knows what the next five questions are likely to be. So if you're asking for a cake recipe, it knows you're next gonna say, uh, what type of flour should I use? How do I make buttercream? Should I use raspberry or strawberry jam? How long do I bake it for? And what kind of topping can I put on it? And so what it ideally wants, rather than you having to go, every time you've got a new question, go back, do a new search, find a different website, it wants to return to the seeker, a website that answers all of those questions. Might not be all in one page, but it's got all of those questions answered somewhere on the website and it leads them through that process. So we will come on in a second to the, to the marketing funnel. But essentially what it wants us to do is start at the top of the funnel and ask our main questions and then provide that follow through that leads somebody through that journey. So for you, Ren, it's probably going to be, you know, they're going to start off with a, a question about what is coaching really broad and you need to answer that and then follow them through that via journey. So what is coaching? How long does it take? How much does it cost? Where can I do it? You know, what, um, how much time am I going to need to dedicate to it each month? All of the rest of it. And then you get to that fire making. So if you can ask and answer multiple questions on all your content throughout your website, your web pages, your blog posts, everything, you're doing Google's job for you and it will reward you for that because you're helping it provide a better service. It wants you to provide a good experience to the seeker. And what this means, this is all to do with something called core web vitals, really. But basically, people expect a certain standard now from websites. Gone are the days where you open a website and a video pops up and starts playing and then an email pop-up sign, an email sign-up pop-up comes up and then the content's moving around and you can't find it and you started reading something and then it moves and you went to click something and you've accidentally clicked on an advert. People will not stand for that anymore. They want a website that is smooth and sleek and loads quickly and is easy to use and they, they expect it to happen quickly and they expect within a few seconds to be able to start using that website and navigating around it. So what this means when we're thinking about how do we design our websites is we, we can't overcomplicate them. You know, the websites, is, websites are set up in a certain way because that's how people know how to use them. We need to make it obvious for people. We need to make it easy and we need to provide a good experience. And I will come back onto that. And finally, it wants us to provide an accessible internet for the impaired. So a lot of people, uh, particularly those who are visually impaired, um, have been excluded from the internet really for, for the last 30 years and, and it's not fair. And Google especially is on a campaign to make sure the internet is accessible for everybody. Now, if you are blind or visually impaired, you will use a screen reader to, to access the internet, which means that when you hover over something, it will read it out to you so that you, you don't have to see it, obviously. Um, if it's text, it's easy peasy. It can just read text, that's fine. But if it's an image, as I said before, it doesn't really know what images are. Computers are getting better at reading images, but they're not great. So that image there, it would know that that is an image of a, of a human putting their thumbs up, but it might not be able to tell whether it's a man or a woman because they've got long hair. So it, you know, it's quite, it's quite interesting. If you have images that are very busy or some elements are blurry, or you're trying to focus on something that isn't in the foreground or whatever, um, it's going to really struggle. So what it needs us to do is tell it what is this a picture of? And we do that in the alt text, which I'll come on to. But essentially, because Google is so hot at providing a, an accessible internet, 
if it's got the choice between two websites and they're pretty much the same and they're both going to answer all of the questions and they're both going to, um, you know, provide a clear path and lots of content and everything else. But one of them has got has, has made sure every little bit of thing is labeled and, and every image has a name and a description and every bit of content has a description and all the rest of it. It's optimized, essentially. Google's going to go with that one because it's gonna provide a better experience, particularly if the user is visually impaired. So you get rewarded quite a lot now for just doing this bit, making your website accessible for people. There are additional levels of accessibility that you can do. So just optimizing your website is basic um, accessibility. There are other things that you can do and a lot of disability websites will do this now. So they have like a higher standard of, of things that they, they follow. Um, and it is making sure that the, the, essentially you already have the software built in that it will start reading things out to people. Or I don't know if you've seen a lot of domestic violence charities will have a thing where you can have like an overlay so that it looks like you're looking for a dress when actually you're trying to find the domestic violence helpline. Oh, I didn't so, know. Yeah, there's there's quite a lot of stuff that people can do now to, to make the you know websites better for their specific set of users. Um, but there are guidelines, the guidelines are out there. And if it is something that you are particularly keen on, if you have um, you know, uh, service users with disabilities, then you can access those really quickly, tell your web developer you need them and they'll be able to implement them. But even if you don't want that extra level, as I say, optimizing works. Any questions on how search engines work or what they want from you or anything? No, I'm happy so far, thank you. Okay, thank good. You. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is create compelling content, uh, which is obviously easier said than done. So what should your content do? Answer the questions your customers are asking. And I cannot say it enough. It's all about asking and answering. And that, that could, should go all the way through. I mean, the, there is one um, of your competitor websites that came up when I was doing your audit. And they do this really, really well. Every single heading um, of every section is a question. And they say, you know, rather than saying, we are grow traffic and we can do this, they say, are you looking for a company that can provide you with this? Are you looking for SEO? Are you looking for a digital agency? Are you trying to get your content to rank better? So they're asking the question from the point of view of the user, rather than them telling you what they want you to know, it's how do we make this website work for the people that are using it? And that's really important when you're doing anything online, you need to put yourselves in the shoes of your customers and say, what are they gonna need from my website? It's not about you, it's about them. It should express who you are as a company. And, and this is really, really important. Um, the way that we engage businesses has fundamentally changed. So, you know, even 15, 20 years ago, you would use a firm probably that came through a personal recommendation or they would be in your town center, they'd be on the high street, they'd been there for 40 years, you knew them, they were reputable, or you went to the yellow pages and you found an appropriate business and phoned them up and had a chat internet, the internet websites have taken away all of that first human contact. So you're not walking through a door or picking up the phone and talking to somebody. You're going onto their website to find out who they are. And if people, if your website doesn't say anything about who you are as a person, they can't make that human connection. So they will assume when they land on your website, if they've searched for something and you've come up, they will assume that you can do your job. They'll assume that if you're doing, you know, relaxed kids, for example, they will assume that you are a qualified relaxed kids coach. So they don't want to know that. What they want to know is, how are you going to treat my child? Why are you going to be different than any other one? What, what special, um, you know, level of training or, or interaction or whatever are you going to do for me? That's what they care about. So you've got to focus on a lot of companies now will not have an about us page, for example, but it's the most visited page on any website. Because people, first of all, they want to know, who are you? Do you look trustworthy? Do you look like we're going to get along? Do you look like you're going to nick my money? If there is a problem, do you look like I can pick up the phone and I can have a conversation with you? Or, you know, is it going to be a situation like you bought something off Alibaba and it's stuck on a, a container ship in China? That's what you want. <laughs> so you've absolutely got to, you know, it, your, your website, when I said it needs to focus on the needs of the user, but it, at the same time, it needs to talk about who are you, who are we as a business? What do we stand for? What are our values? Why are we different? What are we going to do for you? Uh, Rachel, I've got a question. Yeah. Um, what, where do, 
where does the whole search engine stand with videos? Because I like the idea of including videos in my website when I when I update it. Um, I think I think a lot of people nowadays get bored of reading. They've got less and less time, and so I was thinking of doing something like you know thirty second videos on on different things. What what? Yeah. you know where, where do they rank so they are good the the thing here is there's always a um there's always a slight disconnect between what a search engine wants and what a human being wants so you're right human beings don't want to read through rooms and rooms of content they just don't everybody's busy they haven't got time but they will watch a video absolutely google knows that but by the same token it can only judge based on text it, again if it's got a video on there we can tell it what that video is about but it can't really watch it so it doesn't and it won't understand what you're saying. So the text still has to be there somewhere on the website. Now, you can do that in different ways. So what a lot of websites now will do is they'll put video at the top and the video starts playing and that gets the human beings attention and they'll sit and watch the video and they're happy and time on page has gone up and all the rest of it. But the search engine will still need that content below. So they either put it in a drop down box or they have it break, broken up into sections with, with images next to it. So it doesn't look really overwhelming, um, but it, it does need to be there. So it's about striking that balance. That doesn't mean you have to put a transcript of the video up there. It just means you have to say, you know, this is a video of me talking about what we do if you come to me for a counseling session and blah, blah, blah. And, and I'll explain how you get an hour and how we work one on one and all the rest of it. So it, you still write it in a way that if somebody hasn't got time to watch the video or they're at work or they're sat in the wait, doctor's waiting room or whatever and they can't watch a video, they can still get the same information. But yeah, it's about balancing. But videos are perfect. Videos are really good. And Google does know, as I say, all of the search engine algorithms, uh, social media algorithms, everything is moving towards video content now. So it will prioritise that. And if you've got videos on your website, you will rank well. Thank you. OK, so this is the marketing funnel. Uh, if you've ever done any marketing, it's the same marketing funnel that everybody uses. Everyone just has slightly different words for, for these. Some people call it ADA. Some people put an extra layer in. But essentially, it's the same thing. And it's, it's the four stages of, of the marketing funnel. So top of the funnel is people who have never heard of you. They don't know about what you do. They don't know that you can help them. They just know that they've got a problem. So it might be that they've got a, a child that isn't happy or they're not happy or they're not feeling fulfilled. They're going to go to a search engine and they're going to put in a query that, again, that relates to them. So top of the funnel queries are things like, why am I tired all the time? Why do I feel sad? Why is my child crying? Why does my child not want to go to school? Again, think about them. It's their point of view, their problem. They don't know about it yet. So when we're writing content for the top of the funnel, instead of saying things like, um, you know, when coaching can help your child be happier at school, you would start that piece of content with my child is unhappy at school. What can I do? And then you start writing content. So that's top of the funnel awareness. Next stage is interest. So they know that they've got a problem. And they know that there is a solution now. So they've done a bit of Googling and they found out there's a variety of solutions that can help them, but they don't yet know about you and they don't yet know about whether or not you're the right person for them. So they've, they've got an unhappy child at school and they found out that there is coaching available for children. And they're now starting to research that bit. So at that stage, they're wanting to know how is this going to help? Practically speaking, you know, what is it going to take? How is it going to interact with the child? You know, is the child going to feel any negative impact from it? All the rest of it. Then we've got the desire phase. So they know they've got a problem. They know, that there's a, they know that there's a solution. And they know that you exist and provide that solution. But at this stage still, they might still be comparing solutions with other people. So they might have you and they might have another relaxed kids coach. And they might be now looking at your About Us pages and your experience and your case studies and working out which one of these that they're, they're gonna to go to, which one looks like the best fit for the child. And then finally, they're in the decision or the loyalty making phase. They've made a decision, they've got a problem, they've found a solution, they know that you offer it, and they've now decided that you are the right person to offer that. And in this stage as well is where the loyalty starts to come in and the, and the repurchasing. They've, they've made that decision, they've looked at all of the content on your website, everything about you, and they've decided you're the right person. And at this point, they're gonna pick up the phone or fill out your contact form or do whatever. So your website has got to pull people from the top of that funnel 
down through that pathway. What a lot of businesses do with this is <clears throat> map out what the buyer journey is. So what is the what are the usual problems or pain points that they start with? <clears throat> and how do they then progress through to that thing? So what are the questions that they're going to ask at each stage of that journey? What information are they going to need? And it is really practical things like, uh, what are your qualifications? Have you done it before? Can we see an example of some children that you've helped? How much is it going to cost? How long does it take? Do I have to travel to you? Or can we do it online? So all, all of those queries have got to be answered before someone gets to the decision-making phase. Now, again, 20 years ago, people shopped in different ways. So they would get to the awareness and the interest phase. And then usually they would pick up the phone and they would have a conversation and they would say, I've got these questions. I'm not quite sure if you're the right fit. Can I have a conversation about you? People who are over 55, uh, sorry, over 45, will still tend to, to shop in that way. So they'll pick up the phone or fill out the contact form or start emailing or whatever when they're not absolutely sure because they're, they're, happy, they're happy to have a conversation. Younger people on the whole won't do that. They will get every yeah. single question answered before they pick up the phone because a lot of people fear that once they pick the phone up, you're going to railroad them into a sales process and they won't be able to say no and they're not 100% sure yet that you're the right person and blah, blah, blah. So only when they've answered every single question will they pick up the phone. Now, if your website doesn't answer all of those questions, they will go back and do another Google search and they'll start Googling how much does it cost to have relaxed kids coaching and they'll end up on another relaxed kids website and then they'll follow that process through there and, and buy with them instead. So it's so about... Can I ask you something, Rachel? Yes. I don't know if this is not the right time, but um, I have thought often about pricing and whether or not it should you know you should have your prices what well, what's your take on it yeah you should you should right okay Put them front and center because as i say people they just want to know how much it's going to cost they will not pick up the phone and ask you how much is it for a session and if you don't tell people how much it is for a session they will assume more so people always assume more rather than less so by the time that they then come to it, they'll, they'll, either, they'll just go somewhere else or they'll find it on somebody else's website and they'll go, okay, this person's been really explicit about how much it's going to cost. So I'll do my maths. I'll work out how do I fit that into my monthly budget and I'll work out how necessary it is and how many sessions I can have and then I'll pick up the phone. And again, they're on that website doing it rather than on yours. So I would always say put your price on there. Now, if you've got like a complex pricing structure or... Uh, if your pricing changes dependent on the student, just put a rough guideline on. So say, you know, roughly it's £150 an hour or a session is about 200 quid or whatever, um, just so that people can see a guideline. But yeah, I would always say your pricing needs to be on your website for everybody. Okay, thank you. Any other questions on the marketing funnel before we move on? Uh, no, I, ju I, I think um, just an observation really for me is that when I signed up with Yale, um, they did take me through the marketing funnel, um, but I, I'm only realizing now that they use that to do the selling pitch, but not really to build the website yeah. necessarily. So I think I, I really like what the developer did because the developer focused on you know, making it nice and, and functional. But the, the whole part that sold it to me was that I would increase my traffic because of all this that you explained. And now I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm missing so many things. Yeah, but, but you don't know what you don't know and you put your faith in that. Um, and yeah, they absolutely mm. should have done that. And I can see, you know, there's a, there's a, there, there are some really lovely things about your website. You haven't got a bad website. It's just that they should have been helping you, you know, for, for each one of those pages that you've got for your services. Um, you know, it, I, I like your tone of voice. I like the fact that it talks about you. There are some good things, but then it doesn't, there's nothing being added. And I think that's them because they should be saying, okay, as part of this package, we will add X number of pages a month or a year or whatever. And that's how you build out that buyer journey. You, you know, yes, you can build it in from the beginning, but as I was saying before, start with the bare minimum and have a plan for how you build it out and, and answering all of those questions, whether you do that through a blog or a web page or an infographic even, however you do it, it doesn't matter. 
as long as that information, you can even have like an FAQ with a drop down. How much does it cost? How long does it take? Where do I need to travel to? All the rest of it. Um, but yeah, it's that that is a big bit that's missing off the website is that following, pulling people through that funnel. Absolutely. Yeah. And again, when you look at some of your competitors, what you'll see is they've done this, you know, and they've there's some of there's a couple of them. <clears throat> and admittedly, you know, they're big players. You're up against people like Action Coach and Tony Robbins and stuff for some of your keywords. So, of course, they've got a massive budget. They've, they've had years to do it. They've got a lot of money into it. But that's what they do. They put those questions front and center, and that's why they're doing it. And so it's just a case of putting into plan, putting into place a plan to say, OK, we're going to launch with this number of pages, and then I'm going to add a page that, that talks about my pricing and I'm going to add a page that talks about what we actually do in the sessions and I'm going to add a page that talks about how I work, you know, online or in person and all the rest of it. Yeah. It can be done. Uh, can I just ask you, sorry, sorry, does it actually help to link your social media to your website? To, so that, like, does it count? Let's just say, like, there, I've seen people who do it where you go on the website and and you can see like their their socials and sort of their latest post does that help yes and no so it doesn't necessarily help from an seo point of view so mm. what what people do when i when i say you know you've got to update your, your, your website regularly they think that they they put a facebook plugin in and the latest facebook post will appear and yeah. that looks like the website's been updated. Well, it isn't. That that the way that that works is through a plugin. So Google just knows you've got a plugin. It doesn't know how how frequently that's been updated. It can't Google can't get into Facebook to read oh, right. what happens okay. in Facebook. So so it doesn't know what's going on. So it doesn't count it as refreshing content. It just yeah, counts okay. it as you've got a, you've got a social media plugin. Now that's that's worth something. That's not pointless, but it's not doing the job that people think it's doing. What it does do, though, is it helps visitors to your website understand more about who you are. So, again, you should be people should be um, becoming loyal and following you and, and coming back to the website. Mm -hmm. And so if they can see, oh, they've got an active Facebook page, I'll go on Facebook, I'll like the page. Then when you are putting fresh content onto the website, you post that to your Facebook, they'll see that notification, they'll come back, visit the website again, you get those returning visitors. So Facebook and, and all social media has that purpose of, of helping you get those returning visitors and share your content and amplify your content and all the rest of it. It also helps with that whole thing of, do, are they going to trust you? So if you've got on your Facebook page um, examples of people that you've worked with and every time you do a session, you put a photo up and every time you get a new customer, you celebrate it and all the rest of it. Again, that all adds to that getting to know who you are as a company so it so it helps but it doesn't necessarily help from an seo point of view it's more okay. of a human thing so i what i would always say but absolutely have your social media links in there if there's somewhere appropriate you can put a social media feed then absolutely put it on there but sometimes it looks really untidy people do it yes like, yeah i mean I've, I've got the links but i don't i don't have it i had i had uh mixed feelings about it i think when so i in the end i just put the links rather mm. than than the feed that comes up mm. basically yeah and i mean that's that's fine i mean it is really up to you as to how how pretty you can make it because i've seen it as i say where it looks absolute state and it just looks untidy and that that's worse because again it's about you've got to provide a nice experience and it's got to be consistent and it's got to fit in with your theme and all the rest of it but another thing that you want to do is going back to that marketing funnel is think about what stage somebody's going to be at. So you never get to the end of a page without having a call to action or sending somebody through to another page or another piece of content. Yeah. But that might always not be, you know, people, nobody, some people will follow that, that pathway exactly the way you plan it out. Some people won't. Some people will go backwards and forwards. Some people will come in in the middle and then go back up to the top. Some people might take three years to follow that process, <laughs> depending on you know how big a purchase it is for them or how unsure they are or whatever. And, and you need a way of keeping people engaged over that process. So you do need to keep circling people back between the stages at all times. And the way that you do that is through your social media, through your email newsletter, so usually you want to offer several options to people when you're doing a call to action to say, 
you know, would you like to now go and fill out the contact form and have a chat? Or do you want to go find out more about me? Visit my About Us page. Or do you want to find out more about who we are as a company? Follow us on Facebook or sign up to email newsletter. So you're offering multiple choices for people depending on what stage. It's almost like, you know, when you used to have those books when you were a kid where you choose the next level. That yes. It's yeah. like that. And it's just about keep circling people back. And as I say, some people might fuck just be your Facebook friend for three years before they decide, all right, I'm, you know, I've found out enough. I'll, I'll pick the phone up and I'll have a conversation or book a session or whatever. Um, and, and your social media um, serves a, a really fundamental role there in keeping people engaged. So it's important, but it's about kind of keeping it in context. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, so how do you structure content then? Thinking about the, the marketing funnel and everything. So as I said before, there is a basic format that websites follow and all websites follow this format because that's how people know how to use websites. They've been using websites for 30 years now. You know that if you look in the top left corner, the logo will be there and you click on that and it'll take you back to the home page. You know, if you want the phone number or the email address, you look in the top right hand corner and it should be there. You know that roughly the navigation is gonna go home about services, blog, contact, roughly in that order. And then in the footer, if you want the address, you know, look there, you'll find that, you find social media links. So whilst web developers always want to create innovative and fancy designed websites and all the rest of it, that's fine, but essentially the basic structure of a website needs to remain the same because that's that enables people to use it quickly and navigate it quickly. And you're not ending up in a situation where they're spending so much time trying to work out how your website works or navigate it or find the page that they want that they've got bored and gone off and gone to somebody else's website. So this basic structure is, is the one that everybody roughly should follow. And you start with your home page and then you have your about services, whatever, you know, blog, contact. Though all of those are called your parent pages. So they're the top level pages on your website. You then have some drop down pages. There'll be your child pages. And then from there, you might even have another level of drop down pages, which will be your grandchild pages. So you have this sort of hierarchy of website as it goes. <clears throat> when we're thinking about how do you sort of structure that, how do you work out what the hierarchy is? It's back to these several factors. So first of all, what are the keywords? So you can only have one keyword per page. So what are the main keywords, the main search terms that you want to target? Those big ones need to be at the, at the top on the parent pages. So your pages need to be titled something similar to those keywords that you're targeting. So for you, for example, Ren, it's, it's relaxed kids, it's business coaching, it's personal coaching. So you absolutely need a page on each of those services so you can target that keyword. Then you've got to think about where are people entering your website? Now, most of the time, most people will come into the homepage because that's what will show. But if you're creating a lot of blog content, for example, and sharing that across social media, people will be coming off Facebook, clicking the link back to your website and entering your website from that blog post. So is that blog post then, that's your blog post will tend to be sort of top of the top of the funnel. So is it then sending people back to those next stages? Are you sending them to your About Us page next to circle back, to fill in that, that final journey? And are you creating that, um, that, that structure where people can link? So you should always link between your pages to make it easy for them to do that browsing bit. What information do they need at each stage of the buyer journey? So again, you know, follow that buyer journey, map it out ask the questions, what information do they need? And you can ask your customers, you can do this like really practically with people and say, when you were engaging my services, what were the questions you wanted answered? And then you can make sure you've got a page on your website for every single one of those. Um, and then have you created a clear path for them to move through the content? So that means links, but also, as I said before, it means offering different options. So you've got to the end of this page, what do you need to know now? Do you want to know about the pricing? Go here. Do you want to know more about me? Go on here. Do you want to find out more about the company? Go and follow us on Facebook. So always offering those, those different options. But this is about internal links as well. So make sure you are making that obvious for them, whether that's just a, a link in the text or whether it's a box, a big call to action box, come and sign up to my email newsletter or visit my About Us page or whatever it is. You need to make it obvious to people what you want them to do next. Where do you want them to go? How are you going to fill in those stages of the buyer journey? 
Um, so when we're talking about keywords, then this is about keyword hierarchy. So as I said before, you've got your parent pages. You're only ever going to have a handful of these on your website, probably five, no more. So you'll have a home about products and services, blog and contact. Those are usually your parent pages. And those need to be optimized for your big money keywords, usually one or two words, big search volumes, the main thing. What, what do your customers call the main thing that you do? So again, for you, it's, in fact, I'll go... Um, I'll just go to here because this is this is what we do on on this when we look at the keywords here so these are your primary so in your case it's personal coaching business coaching and relaxed kids so we need to make sure we've got a high level parent page on your website optimized for those keywords next we come down to child pages and secondary keywords. So we're getting slightly longer, a little bit more niche, essentially we're adding another word or it'll be a keyword variation. So here for personal coaching, we've gone personal coach, life coach, wellbeing coach. So we need from personal coaching, we need a drop down page, ideally, that, that targets each of those, uh, that is optimized for each of those. It doesn't mean that that, it doesn't mean that you have a page about personal coaching and you have a page about personal coach you could have a page called personal coaching that's your main one and then you have a drop down one that is how much does a personal coach cost so you bet just varying those keywords and making sure you've got all of those different variations throughout the copy and in the optimization but these will be your secondary ones so as we drop down more pages come under that and then again we next go to grandchild pages and we're now into semantic keywords so that's you know, again, adding another word, adding another um, classification. So it might be personal coach for busy women, uh, personal coach in Lancashire, personal coach for developing goals, that sort of thing. Um, hang on, I'm, I'm just, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just feeling like I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not following everything here. So let me just see. Let me just recap what I've understood. So. What I, I've understood so far is that you can only have one keyword per page. Yes. So we have to have those, the, the parent page has got to be very clear. Okay. So, so far I've understood. Yes. Um, but if I think about my website, I've actually, I've grouped it. So I think that under personal coaching, actually I've got like my mindfulness and my coaching and so on. So are you saying that actually what would be better is that as a put so personal coaching so far you you think it's fine but then actually as opposed to having everything on one page we should then have the child pages is that what you're saying Rachel yes absolutely that yes so this page the content that's on it now there's nothing yeah. wrong with it it's absolutely fine but what we do is we have that plan for breaking it out and this is where we're going to have what you're going to build now and we're going to have, how do we add to that in the future in terms of your site map? And, and that might be your six or even 12 month plan of each month, I'm going to add a page and I'm going to do it in this order. But yeah, essentially what we do is we break out these pages. So here we've got life coaching program. That should be a page in itself. So we don't have to take that, but we're, instead of book discovery call, you could have find out more and that takes you to that page. So every single keyword has to have a page by itself. And so you're just building it out and building it out and building it out. And this is what I mean when we look at some of your competitors. I mean, I know, you know, Tony Robbins is, I know it's massive and he's had donkey's years and he's always the top and all the rest of it. But it is a really good example of how to do it. And what you can see is this is, this is what we mean. So every page breaks out into a further page. And then each of these pages then gives you things that you can go and look at. So do you want to read some blog posts? Do you want to see some case studies? Do you want to book an event? All the rest of it. So it, it takes you, you know, you've got drop down, drop down, drop down. Um, and that's essentially it. Because as I say, you can only have one keyword per page. But the more keywords that you have, the more pages that you have that back up that keyword, the better it is. So for example, if you've got, Google's got two websites that it's going to choose which ones it's going to return for somebody's putting business coaching, for example. And it's got Tony Robbins website and they've got a main page for business coaching. And then they've got several pages that target 
um, business coaching for women, business coaching for men, yeah. business coaching in the US. And then they've got blog posts that target how do I access business coaching? How can business coaching help my business? How can business coaching help me earn more money? And all, they've got all that content, all of that supports that primary keyword. So they're essentially proving, I want to rank for this because it's what we do time in, time out. And we've got all of these pages and all this content that proves it. And then it's got one page, you know, another website that's got one page for business coaching. It might be the best page in the world, but the Tony Robbins website is going to win every time because it's proving it time and again and constantly and it's got more content about it. Again, back to that, Google knows what your next five questions will be when you ask a query. So if you've got a website that's already broken that one query down into multiple stages and it's got how does business coaching help me as a person? How does business coaching help me sell goals? How does business coaching help me make money? Those are probably the next five questions somebody's going to ask. So that, that website's got it. It's answered all those queries. Whereas this other website, it's only got one page. It's not really answering them. Obviously, this one's going to win. Okay, thank you. I understand now. Good. Um, so yeah, and then the final, final one is long tail and niche keywords. And this is when we get down to blog posts. So this is when we start, you know, we've added, essentially we've added more words and we're getting really, really um, tailored and niche in terms of what we're asking. So it might be uh, relaxed kids classes in Lancashire for 11 year old boy, very, very specific. And you might, you know, you don't necessarily need a blog post that answers, you know, how does relaxed kids coaching help my 11 year old boy? How does it help my 12 year old boy? How does it help my 13 year old boy? But what you could do is have a blog post that talks about, how it can help children age naught to five and how it can help children age five to 12 and have different content that, that, that targets like that. Those, by the time we get down to these niche and long tail keywords, as we call them, the search volumes are tiny. So there's not massive amounts of people searching for these, but because they're so specific, those people that are searching for them, they're looking for you. You are the absolute right person to provide that service. So again, if you've got an article that targets that, and, and you're backing up all of those other keywords, you're back, your semantics backing up your secondary, your secondary is backing up your primary, you're gonna rank for a, a, a wider range. And obviously again, not obviously, but you know, every time you put up relaxed kids classes for 11 year old boy in Lancashire, you've still got relaxed kids classes. So that's another example of that. And you've still got relaxed kids. So that's another example of your primary keyword. So it's just about creating that critical mass essentially of content to prove that you are worthy of ranking for that keyword. Does that make sense? Yes. Good. Okay, so um, so we first thing you need to do is start doing keyword research essentially. And this is what I've done um, as, as part of the audit. So again, it's thinking about what do, what do our customers call this? So again, your customers might not be looking for relaxed kids, they're probably going to be. I was going to for, say, Rachel, relax yeah. kids. It's not something that is very well known at all. And he's got the word relax. And I, I mean, unless I had come across them, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't have known um, what I was doing at the time. But I, when I wanted to qualify, I was looking for kids, uh, children's coaching. That that was how I came through them. So obviously they've they've done it well and and they've got it right you know in their search engine optimization and um, but that's what I think for me it would be help I need I want help with my child kind of thing yes exactly exactly to get to me yeah yeah exactly and that's what uh, they're, they're going to call it that app but you still need to include those keywords those relaxed keywords because that's the brand name of what you do yeah so it's probably your titles are going to be something along that, and, and you know this is when we get down to subheadings in your pages, blog posts, you know, child pages, all the rest of it. It's going to be things along the lines of how can relaxed kids help my stressed child? Or my child is stressed, can relaxed kids help? Or my child hates school, can relaxed kids help? It, it's that, you know, phrasing it as how are they going to ask it, but how do we also get that brand name in there? Because you're right, relaxed kids have uh, the actual organisation. They're, they're ranking at, like, positions. In fact, they're, they're in your competitor analysis, so... Um, <laughs> Can you see here? So relaxed kids have got, uh, I know this is tiny, but eight. They're ranking for yeah. the top eight of these search results. Um, but 
the websites that they're not doing massively well their blog post is not great they've got a, a nice website but they're not really updating it very often and they're not they've not got a lot of pages and when we look at the other websites that are competing against them um, they're really poor they're, they're tiny websites they've not updated them um, they're, they're not they're not bad in terms of design and layout and they've got some nice people behind them but they're not doing all of the things that they should be doing so what that means is we should be very easily start sorry we should quite easily be able to start challenging that and start knocking them off the top spot and essentially with things like this when you start doing a bit you get like an exponential growth so you should be able to beat them quite quickly so it's a case of i have included it as one of your keywords but you're absolutely right you know we just need your relax kids page your parent page to be optimized for the primary and then the rest of them we're going to be adding in things i mean i've said here you know trainer location qualification classes it's age of child age there you know so it's going to be things like you know my 11 year old boy um isn't happy and stuff um so so yeah so you start from start from the point of view of what are your customers likely to be searching for and put those in and what into google and what google does is it gives you this people also ask and it gives you at the bottom searches related to, and there is some of that data is, I've, I've put it into your, um, your audit, but it's just a case of, if there is a people also ask question on Google, it is one of the most commonly asked questions about that thing. So you need a blog post or a page or something on your website that answers it, it's just basic. So you just start by looking at, okay, what are the keywords that I wanna target? and doing some research and just copy, writing down or copying and pasting, however, all of those questions and making sure you're answering them. You don't have to answer every single one with a unique page or a unique blog post because some of them are quite similar. So you end up getting things like, um, you know, how much does Relax Kids cost and how much does it cost to put my child through Relax Kids coaching? Obviously, what you would do is you would write a blog post about the cost of relaxed kids coaching for children and and ask those variations throughout the test text so keep saying you know, how much does it cost for um boys how much does it cost for girls how much does it cost for a six month however you want to do it um and just make sure throughout everything and that's on your pages on your blogs everywhere that you are constantly asking and answering those questions um, there is another website, so Answer the Public, and again, I've, I've put some of this data into your audit. So this is this tells you um, what questions people are asking on the internet right now about your keyword. So you put your keyword in, and it brings up this map. I've also downloaded the uh, spreadsheets for you so that you've got more data, and I sent you those last night. Um, but you can do two free searches a day on Answer the Public. So even if it takes you a few weeks of putting very keyword variations in and just getting the different ones, it doesn't matter. Um, but basically, what it does is it takes an aggregate of all the search engines, and it looks at what are people asking on the internet right now about that question. And one thing, you will, one thing you will notice about this is that they are top of the funnel queries all time. So it's things like, how does blogging work? How, how is blogging done? How does blogging cost? Because that's what I put in blogging. Um, but they will really be those top of the funnel awareness phase queries are the ones people are asking. And so it gives you that starting point of, okay, these are the questions I need to ask. And then how am I going to answer them on my website? It's brilliant answer the public, I love it. So, First thing to do when we're thinking about how do we make sure we're formatting a website? First thing you've got to do is think about your keywords. And we've done that. You've got that data now in your, in your keyword audit. So we know what keywords people are likely to be using. And just I'll just I'll just nip to, back to this now so you can see. So as I said, this is some of your um, answer the public data. Here's some people also ask all that's in there. But essentially what we've done is I've looked at what keywords are people using now to find the website, which isn't many because you haven't got any traffic? Um, what, are, what keywords are people using to find websites similar to yours? And then where are we going to slot, slot, slot you in? Um, <laughs> and how are we going to work out the, the sort of niche that's right for you? So I think the thing to remember with you is you are in a really competitive industry and you just are, and there's nothing we can do about that. Um, so you've got some 
keywords here in your primary ones, they are big. They've got big search volumes. So personal coaching, if I just find where I've put the, it's not there. Oh, I haven't put you. I haven't put your keywords in. What an idiot. I'll insert those in. Whilst you do that, can I just literally have two minutes, please? Of course. Okay. I'll be back soon. No problem. If anyone else needs a, a toilet break. Yeah, go I'm now. going. I'm going to with coffee. I'm going. <laughs> That was quick on it. I'm back. We're back. Marvellous. Um, I have put it in after all. I just couldn't find it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so what I was saying was business coach and business coaching. Just in Lancashire, uh, we've got almost 3,000 searches per month, which means, you know, they're, they're big, what we call big money terms. There's lots of people searching for these, but they're quite ambiguous. So if someone is searching for business coach, for example, do they want to um, become a business coach? Do they want to hire one? Do they find do they want to find out like research information for a, a study that they're doing? And um, there's lots of different meanings of that, which is why you need that keyword in there because it's what you do. You know, it has you have to have a page optimized for that. It's just basic. But realistically, those primary pages are probably not going to rank for those keywords for you know years, if ever. What you're gonna start ranking for is those longer tail niche keywords, which are the ones that have the slightly lower search volumes. Personal coaching, for example, 480 people uh, a month search for that one. But the more niche we get, again, search volumes will be lower, but they're more likely looking for you. So if they're looking for um, mm. personal coaching in Lancashire by a woman, for example, um, you're going to come up and you're going to be the one that are looking for. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so, so this, is, this is what I've done. And I've, as I say, I've, I've looked at alternatives and I've put the, the answer to the public and the people also ask data in there and what have you. And I have come up with your keyword, uh, with your content strategy off the basis of that. So these are the, the blog titles that I think you should probably start writing now. Um, and then Brilliant. we can look at, as I say, your, your page structure and what we're going to optimize each page for. We can start to look at as you're having that conversation with your, with your web developer. So if you need to know before you speak to him, like what basic pages do I need so we can do your price, we can, we can work that out. That's not a Thank problem. you. Um, okay. So, so yeah, so research your keywords, always step one. Plan your buyer journey. That should be step two. So what, how is someone going to arrive at my website? What questions are they going to need answering? And am I, ans am I asking and answering those questions about my content? And am I, am I going to be able to send them appropriately to the next stage each time? Then you plan your website structure off the back of that. So what are the basic pages that we're going to need? 
So we need those parent pages with those primary keywords. What are we going to have as drop down pages under there? What are we going to do now? What are we going to have as our plan for doing, you know, as we go along? And then finally, write publish content, upload your website. So that is that is sort of website content. Does that make sense? Yep. Any questions on that? Not yet. Marvellous. Right, so number two, optimise your website. So as I said at the beginning, optimising, you just think of optimising like labelling your documents appropriately. So before you put them in the filing cabinet, just put that label on that says to Google or Bing or whatever, this is what this piece of content is about. This is the keyword I'm targeting. This is what my photos are of. This is what um, the content is talking about. This is who I want to show it to. It's just making it really, really blinking obvious that this is the thing that this is about. So it can, you know, file it, uh, crawl it correctly, file it in the correct place and return it quickly. There's no ambiguity about what it is. And the thing about SEO is that it was invented by boys in the 90s. So they've given everything really technical names, which um, it's just jargon. It's just jargon. And, and you don't need to worry too much about what things are called, because actually when you break them down, they're fairly simple. So we're going to look at formatting and H1s and H2 tags, SEO title and page title and slug, all of which are essentially the same thing, meta descriptions, image alt text and internal links. And the other one says it, external links. I don't know why it's falling off the bottom. But link architecture is what SEOs call that. And we will come on more to backlinks after this bit. So when we are talking about writing content for SEO, and this is um, the, uh, you know, whether it's on your web page, whether it's a blog post, doesn't matter what content it is. You need to format it in this basic way. And this is when we talk about H1s, H2s, and paragraph text. Essentially, a H1 is a heading number one. It's the biggest heading. Then you have H2s, heading number two, subheading. Occasionally, you'll have a H3, heading number three, a sub subheading. What I tend to do is if I'm doing a blog post or, or a page, if I've got uh, the main heading always is H1, then you might have a subheading and a bit of paragraph text. So that'll be H2 and paragraph. Then you will have perhaps bullet points. So if you're doing like top 10 tips for something, each one of those, number one, number two, number three, that probably will be a H3. But I very, very rarely go any lower than a H3. And I've never needed to use H4 or anything. They're there, but nobody ever needs to use them. But this, is, this just goes back really to how Google used to understand how important a piece of, uh, each bit of content on a page is. And essentially what it was, was if you put it as a H1, it knows that's the main keyword. If you put it as a paragraph, it knows that's a bit of just a bit of text. If you put it as a H2, it knows that's a slightly important thing as well. Now, Google did say um, a few weeks ago, literally only a few weeks ago, that actually it doesn't judge content on this anymore. It doesn't care whether it's H1, H2, paragraph text, it is able to discern what it thinks you're talking about from the text. It doesn't rely on these making this bit bold, essentially. But right. um, it's still important, I think. Um, and I think it's still important. It's still important from a formatting point of view. But also, this has been the way they've done it for the last 30, 35 years. Now they're saying they're not doing it that way. But Google quite often says things and then rolls it back when it figures out that actually it wasn't as good as it thought it was or it didn't work out how it thought it was going to do. So I'm going to carry on saying, format your text in this way for now. And, and if it changes you know, next year, then so be it. So essentially, you want your big keyword, main question, that's your H1, everything else in paragraph except your subheadings, which are going to be H2s. And it's just a case of formatting in that, in that way. When we're talking about the, the you know, actual sort of structure of the content, it's all back to asking and answering questions. So your, your keyword, your main heading, again, should always be a question and ask it from the point of view of the, of the customer. So rather than saying, are you looking for coaching? You say, I am looking for coaching. Where do I find it? So how are they going to say it and how are they going to speak it into the search engine? So always ask it as a question and then answer the question immediately afterwards. So the reason that we do this is back to those people also ask boxes. 
Google will pick out what from, from content what it thinks is the correct answer for things and show it in those people also ask boxes, show it in the what it calls the knowledge graph. So if you put something to Google and say, ask it a question, it brings up an answer in a box. That's called the knowledge graph. It's taken that out of somebody's web page or blog post or whatever. And it's only able to do that if you ask and then really succinctly answer the question below it. If you get a people also ask or a knowledge graph or whatever, um, it can massively increase your traffic because you're basically being displayed by Google as the correct answer for this thing. So it has huge benefits. They're, they're a rare thing to get. They're a, they're a little bit like golden eggs. Even still now, if we get them, we get dead excited by it. But they can be massive benefits. So it's always good to write your content as though you are aiming to get those people also ask for those knowledge graph boxes. So ask your question, answer it immediately below. Ask another question, answer it. Ask a question, answer it. You can go off in between that and expand on something or talk about your experiences or whatever. But if you were asking, for example, let's take a, a page about the practicalities of the service, you would say, you know, how long does it take per counselling session? A counselling session lasts an hour. The reason it lasts an hour is because we do this, this and this. OK, how much does a counselling session cost? It costs between 50 and 100 pounds. The reason it costs that much is because of blah, 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 blah. So you ask an answer and then expand if you so want. Final bit is your call to action. So as I was saying before, you never let anybody get to the end of a page without giving them a call to action. So what do you want them to do next? Where do you want them to go? So assume everybody is an idiot. Assume everybody reading your website doesn't know how to use a website. They're not going to necessarily navigate back up or head back to the homepage. Where do you want to go? How are you going to fill in that buyer journey for them? So what's the next bit? And again, you want to offer two or three options at that point, depending on what stage of the buyer journey they're at. So it might be, do you want to sign up for my newsletter? Do you want to follow me on social media? Or do you want to read some case studies? Or it could be, do you want to visit my homepage? Or do you want to fill out the contact form and have a chat now? So again, your call to action is going to depend on where they are in that buyer journey, which bit of content they're on, but always try, always have one and always try to give two or three options for variations. Does so yesterday I yeah. got an inquiry uh, from a lady who wanted to book a coach for her son's wedding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh my gosh. I'm thinking, I, I, I mean, I know it's on my, it, how is it not obvious that I don't sell don't my do coaches? For it. <laughs> I couldn't believe it because she went into detail about where I should pick up from, where I was dropping off, you know. Oh my gosh, I thought, oh, great. <laughs> oh my God. How much was she willing to pay? Like, you could have had a nice little learner for a weekend job there. <laughs> This is what I mean, though. Assume everybody is media. I know, you've that's why I was laughing. Yeah, funny. you've got to build a website for the lowest common denominator okay. and make everything obvious. Like, you know, if you want them to go here next, make the button really big and really bright so that they can't miss it. But yeah, you'll always get people who want to come. That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> Idiots. <laughs> Um, okay, so really practically speaking, just a little bit back to sort of paragraph. When you're uploading into the back end of your website, all of these pictures are taken from WordPress, but all back ends of websites work roughly the same way. Essentially, it will go in when you copy and paste it or type it in, however you put the content in there, it'll go in as paragraph. So what you need to do is select uh, the bit of text that you want to be a H1 or H2 and, and change it in the drop down box. Now, you only have one H1 per page, that's your main keyword, and then you have two, three, four, H2 subheadings. And again, H3 might be there if you have paragraphs or numbers or whatever, but probably you're not really gonna use that one very often. But um, again, I'm gonna send you um, the, the crib sheet and the infographic crib sheet. So you've got this information in like, uh, in fact, I'll show you. It's, it's like a step-by-step. -step, so you can literally have it next to you as you're doing this uploading bit. So that's the image one, yeah, okay. it talks you through it. And then we've got a text one, which is exactly the same thing. So as I say, don't feel like you have to remember every stage of this. And also this bit is the bit that we do go over again when we're doing the better blogging. So this is, yes. you know, yeah. the, the other thing to remember about SEO is when we're doing this bit, 
as long as you do most of it, most of the time, it's fine. If you forget to put some H2s in one time or you forget to put a meta description in, the world is not going to end. It's just about having yeah. most of these things done across most of the website because it's just about making it really easy for Google to understand, basically. Um, so it. SEO title, page title. This is the bit where if you're on the internet and you hover over the tab for someone's website, that's where the keyword pops up. Um, and, and so it's, it's, what is this page called? What's the title? Ideally, it should be the same as your H1 because your H1 is your keyword. So you most of the time, you're just going to have your H1, you're going to copy and paste it, and you're going to put it into the SEO title box, the page title box, all of these um, SEO plugins. So these are taken from Yoast, which works with WordPress, which is what I've recommended you have your, your new website built in if you can. Um, but all of them, whether we use Rank Math SEO or all-in-one SEO or Wix or Squarespace, they all have a box for this information, but they just call it different things. So some call it page title, some call it SEO title, but essentially you copy your H1 and paste it into this box. And it's just really explicitly telling Google, this is what this page is about. This is the keyword I'm targeting. There's no question that's. So, you know, I've been, well, I used to have WordPress and then I went over to Wix. Um, I, I don't know, I mean, what the developer will do. Anyway, not that it matters. As you say, we can, uh, it will work anyway. But when I've written the last couple of uh, rare blogs that I have, um, I haven't seen any of this. So I've just gone in and I've clicked write blog and then I've published. Does it mean that there is a back end that I have an access? Basically, have I missed a trick effectively? I don't know because I don't know through Yell how locked down it is. So the thing is that I know through Wix that you can do all of this. I know it's there. We've got Wix websites for clients that we work on and, and you can put it in. But because you've got a Wix website through Yell, they might well have restricted which bits you can see and which bits you can't. In fact, they probably will have. Um, because it stops you gaining control of your website, essentially. So I would imagine if you can't see this, if it's not obvious, it's because they've stopped you having access to that little bit. So you might well not have been able to do any of okay. this in terms of the blog. Tour blog. I know that there is optimization on the website. I can see it. So someone has done it. I can see it in the back end. So I know it's been done for the main pages. Um, but yeah, in fact, let's, let's have a quick look now. Let's have a quick look at because I don't think I, I necessarily checked all of your blogs. Sorry, yeah, it's got some, it has got some. It's got a meta description there. Today has been so emotional. So what happens is, and this is quite interesting actually, if you don't provide a meta description, if you don't specify in there what you want it to be, it will take the first paragraph of your blog post and use that as a meta description. So because you haven't been able to actively put that information in, it's taken this and put today has been so emotional, okay. I was asked to take a leap of faith and I did it. So it's got some optimization on there, but it's not relevant, really. It's not, what does that mean? You know, Google's looking at that and going, okay, this is what she wants to rank for. Today has been so emotional. Where am I going to put that? So it's not got a keyword in there. It's not explaining, you know, obviously what you're doing. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I would say probably, if you can't see that, you're probably locked out Okay. Uh, but if you have where WordPress, let's say if you have WordPress going forward, it's really easy to do all this, really obvious, um, makes life much, much easier for you. And you can control all of this. 
So your slug is then is your forward slash bit that comes after the main domain of your website. So ren.coaching forward slash. Da, 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 da. So in that one, we were just looking at it was forward slash courage to leap. So it's taken again, it's taken your your head, your heading, your H1, your main thing as your keyword and use that as your slug. Again, WordPress will do this. It will it will determine from your, your main heading what it thinks your slug, your slug should be. So really, you do just want to copy and paste your H1 into there. You can, um, if it's not relevant, if you want it to be something slightly different, or if it's massively long, like that one there, that example is a little bit long. If you wanted to shorten it, that's fine, um, but only do it before you've published it. So once your page is published, this is your address, essentially, of where that page is on the internet. So once it's published, if you change this, you're essentially moving where the page is and the internet then can't find it, the internet gem. So you have to put a redirect in. So basically the rule is if it's already published, leave it. If it, if you're uploading this for the first time and you want to make the slug more relevant or more relevant to your H1, to your keyword, then absolutely copy and paste and put it in that, that, that box as well. So, so far we've put our keyword in our H1 and we've copied that and we've put it into our SEO title and we've put it into our slug and we've put it, so it's in three places. Next thing then is the meta description. So this is the bit that it serves two purposes. This is the bit that Google will read first off to say, what is this piece of content is about? So you need to really succinctly say, this is what this page or this blog post or whatever is about. But this bit of content also shows if you Google something and, and your search, your web page or, or blog post or whatever comes up in the search results, it's the bit of content that shows underneath. So again, if you don't specify, it'll take the first paragraph, but it, that often won't make sense. So what you need to do is have what two short sentences. First one, this is what it is. Second one, this is what I want you to do for the humans who are reading it. So again, copy your H1 and paste it in. <laughs> and here, you sometimes have to do a little bit of linguistic gymnastics. So for example, uh, I was I was optimizing some blog posts yesterday and they're for a company that does um, smart cards. And so all of the blog posts were about, um, can I clone a smart card or can, can my smart card be cloned? Uh, can I have a, a sustainably renewable smart card? Now, if you put that in a meta description, you're going to paste it in and you're going to say something along the lines of, today we are asking, can I have a, 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 an environmentally safe smart card or whatever? So you still need though that key, um, keyword in exactly those words, but you might have to work your sentence a little bit weird to fit it in. So it's usually along the lines of, today we are asking, can I do such and such thing? Or you might have been asking, can I do such and such thing? In today's blog post, we're going to answer it, or this piece of content is what it's about. So if you were doing, for example, your pricing page, it would be, how much does it cost to get coaching? And you would say, you might have been asking, how much does it cost to get coaching? Well, on this page, we'll explain all about our pricing structure here at Ren Coaching. Read on to find out more. So it's about what is it about and what do you want somebody to do? You want somebody to click, you want somebody to read it. So make it sound a little bit enticing. If you were seeing it on a, a, a busy Google search engine results page, what would make you click on that one as opposed to the other ones that are going to come up? So you're trying to get someone's attention without being too clickbaity. It also shows on Facebook as well. So if you share your blog post to Facebook or LinkedIn or whatever, it's the bit that will show underneath the photo. So again, it needs to sound a little bit interesting. And then finally, image alt text. Um, <clears throat> so, again, this is primarily for people who are visually impaired, but it does also help Google to understand. So, as I said before, search engines still really struggle to see images. Like, it would have no chance of reading that one at all. It just couldn't do it. So, it's relying on us to tell it what this is a photo of or what, what the text on the photo says. If you've done a... Um, uh, uh, like a title graphic, for example, and you've put words over your title graphic of your blog, it can't read those words. So it's relying on us telling it what it's going to say. So you are going to literally describe the image as though you are telling it to a blind person. So that one, it would be blue plaque on a wall and the plaque reads 
da, 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 da. so you literally would have to type out the whole of the text so I don't know if you've seen recently quite a few people have started doing this on social media so it, well, they'll put a photo up and then they'll say uh, image description and it's like you know <laughs> pink background with a yellow circle and, and in the circle is text that reads blah 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 so you you are describing it you do still want the keyword in there so this is where you again you start to get a little bit um imaginative with your text so i would say blue plaque on a stone wall blue plaque reads blah 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 to illustrate my post about paste my keyword in mm -hmm. so you've got yeah. your keyword yeah. in there but you've also done what you need to do in terms of, of making it you know accessible again okay. copy and paste your keyword so we have now um, copy and paste our keyword in five places. So it's in the H1, it's in the slug, or it's in the SEO title, it's in the meta description, and it's in the image description. And that's the key thing. It says that on those crib sheets, but keyword in the five main places. That's the thing to remember. So internal and external links. Okay. <coughs> so this is linking between the pages on your website, but it's also linking out to other web pages um, across the internet. If you're using Yoast or Rank Math or whatever, they won't tell you you've done it right if you haven't got at least one internal link and at least one external link. So it is really important to, to remember to put those in. Internal links, you select the bit of text and you tell it which page you want to link to. Now, the thing with that is, remember to try and use a keyword as an anchor text. So rather than saying, uh, if you want to read our last blog post, you can find it here, and here mm -hmm. comes the link. Uh, here means nothing. So you want to go, if you want to read our last blog post about coaching children, you know, you can find it in our blog post. So you would use coaching children as your anchor text and link out to the blog post about coaching children or a page about it or whatever. So always use a keyword as your anchor text. In terms of external links, so sorry, just internal links as well, you're always going to have one on because every single page should at least be linking to your contact page. So there's, by default, there should be one on there. But ideally, you want three or four. So make it logical, make it natural. But if you mention, um, you know, my name or Ren Coaching or whatever, link from that to the to your about us page if you mention any of your products or services link to that page if you mention case studies link out to the case study or the blog or whatever so you know make it natural but try and get a few in there because all of that first of all helps people browse which helps you ranking factors but also it just makes it um you know no page should exist by itself you need to again prove that all of your pages across your website are interlinked because they're all related to each other and it's all what you do and you're backing up this keyword with this piece of content and all the rest of it. So try and aim for sort of three to four internal links per page. External links is linking out to somebody else's website. So again, as I said, most SEO plugins won't give you, like Yoast gives you green lights, traffic light system, won't give you a green light if you haven't got one external link. But sometimes it just isn't possible. You know, sometimes you can kind of fudge it. So during the pandemic, every time we were writing a blog about COVID, we would link out from COVID to the, either the government or the NHS website about COVID. Um, but sometimes you can't force it, even if you've been a little bit fudgy. Sometimes it is just a web page that's about you and what you do. And there's no way of linking out to anyone else. That's fine. If you can't do it, you can't do it. Uh, but if you can, even if it's a bit cagey, try and get one in there. And again, you select your anchor text. Make sure the keyword is the anchor text that links out to the, the relevant page. So five main places, H1 tag, first paragraph of the text, SEO title or page title or whatever slug, meta description, and, and image description. So meta and image description. Uh, yeah, filing cabinet. Um, so how are you gonna optimize your website? Make a keyword plan. So you've got that, we've done that already. That's in your audit. So we've got a keyword plan. All we need to do is marry up those keywords to whatever pages on your website. So when we work out your site map and say, okay, we're gonna build these pages to start with, each one of those will get married to a keyword and then you've got your keyword strategy as well as the plan. Get an SEO plugin. Obviously you can't do that until you've got your new website. Fill in your SEO data. And again, doesn't have to be every single box. 
as long as you've done most of it across most of the website, you will have a well-optimized website. And sometimes, you know, especially with Yoast, people spend hours trying to get the little traffic lights to go green. If you can't do it, you can't do it. If you know you've put your keyword in your five main places and you've written a good piece of content, you've put some images in there, that's fine. That's done. Don't, don't waste any more time on it. And then revise periodically. So the thing with this is, once a website is done, optimized, pretty much it's done. You don't need to keep going back and fiddling with it. But websites do sort of break um, as the older that they get, the more like a link will get broken or a page will move or, you know, things just naturally happen. So about once a year, just run a crawl and you can find loads of these. They're free, just putting free SEO crawl into Google and it'll, it'll pull you one out. And that'll tell you, you know, what sort of, what's missing, what's going on. Are there, are there broken links? Are there things we need to worry about? And just do a bit of maintenance. So once a year, at least, just, just spend a bit of time mending if if you if there was a link that went from a blog post to a home page but now it's it's gone or that blog's been taken down or whatever just make sure you sort of tidy it up but it doesn't need to constantly change once it's once it's done those are the keywords that's going to be your keyword strategy for the next five ten years you're just going to keep building on targeting those keywords so it's just a case of maintenance any questions on that bit I think it will become more obvious as um, maybe I get involved in it because it, it sounds more alien. This second section, you know, it's more theoretical. So without doing it practically, and mm -hmm. um, whilst I understand what you're saying, I, you know, I don't know with the practicality, you know, yeah. where, where I'll have to click and all of it. So I think I, I feel less clear. The first part was, you know, I could relate to it more because I'd be more involved with that part. This part, it's a bit more like, oh, this is very technical. So yeah. I'm trying to take it in. Yeah, but I, I get that. I get that completely. And yeah. I, I'm, I'm the same, Ben. I, I only learn by doing. So I will only take all of that bit in once I've done it. But this is why yeah. you do it now. Like that, that was your whistle stop tour introduction to it. I'll yeah, give you yeah. the, 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 the resources that literally when you come to do it, they literally talk you step by step through it. So it's, you know, you have it either next to you or on your screen or however you do it. Um, but again, we do it again when we when we do the best blogging. So we'll go over all of that again, which will be a refresher so that when you come, it is hard to do it because every website, uh, every website content management system is ever so slightly different. They have these, they all have these boxes, but they just have them in slightly different places. Um, and so the first time you do it, absolutely, you, you'll sit there and think, I can't remember what she said, and I panic, and, and that bit doesn't look like it looked the same on that picture, and blah, blah, yeah. blah. But as I say, the resources will help you through it. And if you need a refresher once the website's launched and you're actually coming to put your first blog post up, we, you know we'll do it then so it's 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 fine I, you, you're not expected to understand it at this point essentially but you will no. understand it by the end <laughs> yeah okay um but the, the things that you were explaining to me they are relevant not just to the blogging they're also relevant to the pages that uh, of the website aren't they yeah so at this point then because i'm i i will have a developer what what do you suggest because on one hand I don't want him to you know I mean obviously he'll know probably know a lot more than me but what how do you interact then or how should I interact with my developer because I didn't ask all these questions at the time when I heard it through Yale <laughs> what would you have would you have like a document that you put together and you say I expect you to cover these points when you build my website yeah, I mean, it, it oh, wow. depends How does on it the work? developer. Uh, it, in all honesty, it depends on the developer because some developers do this, though they will. But SEO is a different discipline now to web design. It, it did all used to come under the same umbrella and now it doesn't. So as I say, some, some web agencies will do the whole thing and they'll fill it out, but they tend not to fill it out very well. They tend to, you know, I can see even the, on, the, on the one that you've got now, there's a lot of inconsistency in keywords. And this is done by professional web builders from Yelp, supposedly. And on some of them, like on your business coaching page, I think, they've used a different keyword in every single box. So they've used business coach, business coaching, business coach, Lancashire, 
you know, so they've essentially tried to squeeze five keywords into one page, which is just not going to work. That, you know, Google go, well, you're cheating. You can have one keyword, that's it. You can't have five. Um, so I can see that they've done it, but they don't do well. And that's the thing. Web companies, some of them will do it, but they might not necessarily do it well. Some of them will say to you, I'll put Yoast on or I'll put SEO plugin on or whatever, but it's up to you to fill it out because it's not their forte and they know they won't do it well. And some of them won't do it at all. So when you are having so then, that, yeah. So then would it be a matter of of having it so of I will with this training will help me understand what kind of content I need to write and how mm-hmm. to write it and that and I understand uh, which I will then hand over to the developer and then it would be a matter for me to go back into the website and and sort of look at um what keywords they've used potentially right, when they were yeah. building it I mean it is about having that honest conversation up front because you're right you need to know what they're going to do and they would appreciate you being uh, you know, asking those questions anyway, because then they know where they stand. So I think just ask and say, I would, well, it'd be part of the record say, I want an SEO plugin on there. They're free. So, and it takes two minutes to put one on. So you're not asking them anything complex. So I want an SEO plugin on there. Will you be up, up in, put, in putting the information or will that be on me? And if it's on you, then we can go through it and do it together. But yeah, if, if they're going to do it, you'll be going through and checking that they've put the same keyword in all the places and they've not checked, switched and changed around and all the rest of it. So it's up to you. So you might decide, actually, if I've got to go through it anyway, it might be quicker for me to do it. But if they're, okay. if they're good yeah. at it. I mean, again, I would probably ask the question. I'll say, do you know, do you know, and try and do it in a non-patronizing way, but do you know how to fill out Yoast if we put Yoast on there or whatever? But okay. yeah, it is a conversation you need to have with them. And, and at the beginning, not not sort of halfway through. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so off-site SEO. Everything that we've just done is, is what we call on-site SEO. So that's you are on your website, making sure all the information is correct. The next bit, this last bit, and I promise we'll, we'll speed up a bit. Oh my God, I've only got 15 minutes left. Um, but is, <laughs> this is off-site SEO. So this is everything that you do on the rest of the internet to make sure your website gets found by people. Again, as I said at the beginning, um, you, once upon a time, you uploaded your website and it, it sank or swam based on how good it was. Nowadays, because there's so many websites and so much competition, it's about proving that you don't just exist in, in your individual little thing, that you exist in an ecosystem online. So as I said, you need to be linking out to other websites. You need to be mentioning suppliers and clients and have what we call trust signals on the website and you know which is client reviews and and logos of partners that you work with and suppliers as I say so it's about proving that you don't just exist in isolation you are a real business you're active everywhere online this again is where your social media comes into it this is where your google my business card comes into it so and in fact I'll just quickly go back to the um, to the audit because this is this is what we look at when we look at you know your search visibility so if somebody's searching specifically for your website they've put your business name in what comes up what do they find and it is things like you know has your google my business card been filled in are there images um you know are there videos it, are you coming up top and what you'll see as well is that your facebook facebook linkedin twitter All of these profiles should also be appearing in your search results. As I said before, Google can't get into Facebook to read what's going on, but it does know whether or not you have a business account. So having a presence on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, all the rest of it helps because you then will appear. You'll appear with your website, then your Facebook, then your Instagram, then your uh, Twitter, and your Google My Business card will be there. There'll be lots of photos on there of you in action. And again, it's just proving when somebody Googles you or Google is looking at who you are, I'm a real business. I'm a real business. I'm present on all these things. I'm updating it. I appear on lots of places over the internet. So it's all about credibility and authorship. So one of the first things that we look at when we're, when we're thinking about this is backlinks. So backlinks are... are phenomenally complicated when you start getting into the deep part of it but to simplify it it is somebody linking to your website as i said at the beginning it's somebody saying the content on this website 
is worthy of you going and reading it. And I'm telling you that you, my loyal audience, go on this website. So it's it's essentially a trust thing. There are different levels though of, of backlinks and without getting too deep into that, that diagram there, essentially the, the better the website that links to you, the better it does. <clears throat> so all websites have a thing called domain authority or domain trust. Every website starts with a score of zero and the best websites have a score of 100. So BBC, Facebook, Twitter, they're either high 90s or 100. So most small to medium businesses sit somewhere in the middle, generally around 25 to 45 in terms of domain authority. Now, if you have, say if you're at 25 and a website like The Guardian writes an article about you and links to you, they've got a high domain authority. So that gives you a lot of link juice. That's very beneficial to you. But because The Guardian is just a, a general thing, they don't really know about what you do or your industry. You might just pay them for a PR piece. So if another coach links to you and say they've got a domain authority of 50, even though it's less, because they're from within your sector, their link is trusted more. So you get more link juice from that. So when we're talking about, you know, how do you build backlinks? And at the minute, you have no backlink profile. You have a tiny handful of, of websites that are linking to you. So it's about thinking, okay, we need to, I need to get some websites to link to me. Who is going to be a good person? And you might decide, I want to spend some money on some PR and get some actual articles from respect to publications. That might be the way you go. Or you might say, actually, um, I, I think it would be better if I reached out to some people from within my sector who aren't my direct competitors and I got a backlink off them. Now, you're not just going to magically get a backlink. You've got to provide somebody with some content. You've got to give them a reason to link to you. So usually you would contact somebody and say, please, can I write a guest blog for your website or a, an article or a press release or something? for their website, targeting their audience, you're doing them a favor because they're getting free content that they don't need to write and you out of it get a backlink that links back to your website. Now, what some people will say is, I'll give you a backlink if you give me one. Now, what they don't realize is actually that devalues it slightly because that essentially one cancels out the other because Google will look at it and go, well, you've obviously just done that to build backlinks. You've linked to them, they've linked to you, so that's pointless. So if somebody says, yes, can I have a backlink too? You say, I'm sorry, that just won't add value to you. But, you know, potentially here are some other websites that I've found. Maybe you could go and ask them and get a backlink on their website. So it needs to be genuine. It needs to be authentic. It needs to be good quality content you're putting out there. If I you think are, this is high. This is like, uh, you know, two levels up, by the way. <laughs> Gosh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not at this point yet. But if you start producing um, good blogs, if you start writing really good blogs on your website, what you can also do is like approach people and say, I've written this really good guide, for example, on how to, um, you know, 10 ways to make children happier at school. Would you like to link back to it? So people naturally will start to find your content. You can go and you know directly point it out to them and say, would you like to link to it? But the more content you're creating, the better quality it is. This is how you build your backlink profile. So you're right at the moment, and I've put this in the order, backlinks is way down the line. We're, we're not, okay. you know, once the website's Fine. live, then we'll start worrying about backlinks. But it might be something that you want to start having on your radar, start having those conversations, because it takes a while, because you've got to find an appropriate website, start a conversation with the right person, agree a title, you know, agree what you're going to talk about, all the rest of it. So it can be quite a lengthy process. So sometimes it is worth, you know, just having it in the back of your mind when you're talking to people, especially if they're in your industry, or you write a blog, would you mind if I write a guest blog for you or something like that? Okay. But the rest of it, like the actual nitty gritty of, of what is worth it, are, you know, don't don't get into all of this bit here about no, no, this bit fine. of juice is worth this and that bit of juice, don't worry about it. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> uh, oh, I've said this, how do you get back links? Um, yeah, various ways. Fine. So yeah, compelling content, um, PR, as I say, so it, 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 can, it can be worth if you get it. Uh, an article placed. So we had a, a client the other day got an article placed in the sun. They were getting a third of their traffic from that, but they've paid a shit of a lot of money for it. So, you know, it's weighing up the pros and cons, but it can be good. 
So citations, what is a citation? A citation is where you are listed on somebody else's website. So with a backlink, you've got that link back to your website because you've produced a piece of content for them. For citations, you haven't. You've just got a listing. It might be a business website, like it might be yell.com. It might be um, that you've got like a, a register of coaches in Lancashire and you get on there. It might be other things, but these are also ways that Google judges. Again, are you a genuine business? So are you on all of these listing websites? Do you appear? Few things um, sorry, Rachel, yeah. on this on this point, I, I think that that's what Yell was using when they sold the service to me. Um, they said that they would cite my website across. And I can't remember what number they used, but it was a big number. So I, I have to cancel this week with them because my 12 months are up, not for the website. The website uh, expires in June, but mm. for the the first half of the contract was the um the listing so that they are i would rate high like first uh, in colton and yorkshire whatever so they said that they would list my site in loads of places and i'm worried that now when i call them because i'm sure that they'll tell me loads of stuff and bamboozle me with how bad it is to you know cancel they'll say that then my reputation will be even worse because right. they were they were listing me in all these different places and they showed me something to that effect. So can you can you tell me whether that is right or not? Yes, I absolutely can. So th this here, and I've, I've sent you a copy of this, this is your online listing score. Now you've got 73% correct, which is, is good. So of the places that Google mainly checks, which is all of these websites, you know, you have a listing and it's on there. And the other thing is, it's been done correctly. So it's really important when you're doing it that your, your address is exactly down to RD as opposed to road, down to where the, the comma got, everything needs to be perfect. That's been done. And you are, you know, you can see you're, you're actually much better. Most of the time I look at these, I, I pull these off for people uh, and, and it's like most of it's red. Most of yours is green. So they are on there. Now, if they are saying that you're, you need to continually pay in order to remain on these websites. Yeah. Then a, yeah. that's a little bit naughty. Um, but B, what they're holding, they're, they're, they're hanging the hat on the fact that you don't know how to put yourself on here. So essentially, yes, they'll take you off and then that will damage your reputation. But if they take you off, you can go to all of these websites and it's really easy. You literally just go to silex.com or hotfrog.com and go i want to register my business and you input your details and they'll send you an email and you click confirmation and then you're you're, you're on there your listings on there you're on the website some of them you might have to pay a small fee but it's never more than like five pounds a month whatever most of them you don't so essentially you have the power now if they say we're going to take you off and move you from all of these say okay fine and, and you will be able to go through, say, I want, a, I want a report from you of which websites I've been on, and then you can go and, and approach them. So it's a little bit time consuming, but you've got the power to remedy it. It won't damage you if you are removed for a short period of time and then you go back on and put yourself on there, that won't damage you. But yes, taking you off and leaving you off would damage you. And that, that's, that's really, the, like every time you tell me something more about these guys, I get more and more cross. I'm really not. Mm. Does that does that help? Do you know what to say? Yeah, I'm just um it it put it um it puts me off cancelling though in part because I think gosh, it's a lot of work <laughs> and well, to, to go through. Do you know what I mean? Um, it isn't, it isn't. But, I mean it, it realistically it, you could do it in an hour. Mm. So realistically, if you sat down with the report that I've sent you and just went on all those websites and did it, you, you could get them all back in and out, depending on how what, what they give you. So ask, you know, that one that one I've printed out is the one that checks the, the most common ones. But ask them for a report and say, I would like a listing of where I'm current, a report of where I'm currently listed and see how many there are. You know, they might only put you on five and they might be holding you to ransom over that. Um, but if they've put you on 500, then yeah, um, you know, that's going to probably take you a little bit longer, but I don't think they have because you are not, um, you're not getting any traffic. 
So essentially, you've got nothing to lose at this point. Well, that's what I was thinking, because on paper, when we first started, they showed me how I wasn't appearing anywhere. And then they said that thanks to the work that they did, I was I was then featuring on all these different, um, I can't think of a word, but yeah, directories. But it's not as if I'm getting the, the inquiries though. So when you say that it could damage me, um, how, how so? Because it's not as if I'm getting the, the inquiries anyway. That's the bit that confuses me, if you like. Yeah. You, you are getting, this is your traffic then here. It's at zero all the way along. You're not getting any traffic. Um, when we look at all of your figures here, you know, organic search traffic is none. You've appeared for two search results, but they're, they're Wren School and Wren Blackburn, but neither of them are relevant to you. So they haven't clicked through to you, but that's how, that's only appearance that you're getting. So it, it could, realistically, if you're gonna do it, do it now before the new website goes live, because you, you've nowhere to fall at this point. You can only go up. So yeah, it, it, theoretically, it, it, the way it would damage you is it would make it take slightly longer once you do start optimizing, because Google will go, well, you were on all of these citations, so why did you come off them? But if you come off the citations, go back on, and then switch your website over, Google will recognize what you are doing. It will know that you are, changing supplier or changing your website or updating or whatever so so now is the time to do it essentially don't if don't sign up for another year certainly because that they're absolutely holding you to ransom but, but absolutely get a report from them to of, of how many you're actually on because that'd be interesting to know but even then you know like i said you could do it do it an hour every three months or whatever and just put yourself on a handful more each time as long as you're on those main ones which are the ones that come up on this um mm -hmm. that's all that matters and this will take you this will take you an hour to whiz through and just sign up to all of these okay and that's easy peasy so Thank don't you. don't let them bamboozle you or frighten you basically okay so so citations are important but but i do think it's important to put this in the context Citations are a tiny piece of this. It's all, it is all about adding that authority of how you appear online. But nobody goes on a citations website to find a business. They just don't. So they are, you, the reason you are on a citations website is to prove that you are a legitimate business operating in a business sphere so that Google can go, okay, yeah, look, the list on all these places is obviously real. But, but nobody's going to go and look at you. So how they think that that is going to, giving you a lot of citations is going to help your traffic is just bonkers because it won't because people don't go there. When did you ever go to a citation website to find a business? You just no. don't. You go to Google and you Google it. So yeah. you've got, you, you know, they're, 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 folk, they're selling, they are a bit funny, they're very naughty. Um, <laughs> but yeah, but have that conversation and then and if you want to let me, me take a look at, at what they come back with, that's absolutely fine. Um, okay, Google Maps. So Google Maps, you have actually got a really good Google Maps and a really good Bing places for business listing. So you've got photos on there, all of your reviews and your information, everything's filled in. So I don't actually have a lot of recommendations for you in terms of these. I would perhaps say leave, a, leave yourself a note to just every three months, either put a little, um, either put a little uh, like post on there or just go in and update some photos. So again, the reason that Google invented Google My Business and then Bing followed with Places for Business is because people weren't updating their websites regularly and Google didn't know whether or not they'd gone out of business. So it brought in Google My Business. It's also moving towards this, what it called one-click search. So essentially, people will find out a lot of the information they need about you just from the Google result. They won't even click through to your website. So if they want just your address or your phone number or whatever, they get that from Google Maps. So it is really important that your maps and your Bing places for business listings up to date. So a lot of people do them and then never go back to them and they leave them. But it is something you need to have as a reminder to at least every three months, just go and update them, put some new photos in, okay. get a new review on whatever, because it's one of the few ways that Google can tell that you're still busy and yeah. it does yeah. help you appear in maps and things like that. 
Also, a couple of points there. So uh, make sure you use your keywords as well in your Google listing. So when you're talking about the services that you do, I know if you're specifying services, you can only use their drop down. But when you when you get the chance to talk about it, use your keywords. So I am a business coach and a lifestyle coach and I'm a trained relaxed kids coach or whatever it might be. So make sure they're in there. Be a trusted authority. So this is back to that thing of the more places you appear on the on the internet, the more you are seen as, as trustworthy and, and genuine and a real business. So the more articles and blog posts and stuff you can write for people, the better it will be. If you're uploading an image of yourself, whether it's through your website or on Google My Business or wherever, make sure your name is attached to it. So if people are looking up images, lots of images of you come up. Um, make sure as well that your social media, as I say, that you've got at least Facebook, LinkedIn and Twitter, because those are the ones that appear in the search results. But again, make sure those profiles are optimized. Make sure you're using a picture of you that's really clear and it's the same picture across Google My Business and Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter. So it's really obvious. This is this is this person. Or you use your company logo, whichever you want to do. Um, but this is this person. They have this profile here, here and here. You know, they're everywhere. We can see that they're a genuine business. That's what it's all about. The more... Um, articles and, and, and content and stuff that you can do, the better. So again, if you are uh, ever a keynote speaker somewhere or you are doing a webinar or something, make sure your name is in it and you're linking back to your website. If Even if it's like from Ticket um, Eventbrite or the, the organization, the, the conference organizer's website or whatever, make sure you're getting those links and that your logo is there and all the rest of it so that Google really clearly knows, okay, that's that person from that website. They're on this website as a keynote speaker. They're on YouTube doing a TED talk. You know, they were on this website booking a tip because they were a, a headliner for this ticketed event or whatever. So again, it's just about all of those links all the time should be going back to your website and proving again that, First of all, that you are an expert in what you do, but but secondly, that you exist uh, in a in an ecosystem and you're recognised and stuff. Even better, if you can get like pictures of you with people, you know, other people, respective people, whatever, and and have your name and their name tagged. Again, that helps become a little bit like a backlink. So Google will go, okay, well you know, they're obviously well-respected within the coaching industry because here's a picture of them with this other well-known coach from the area or whatever. Yeah. So it's all about authority. So claim your Google and Bing listings. You have already done that. So just go back and, and give them a little bit of an update and set a reminder to do it periodically. Check your other business listings. We've talked about that. We can get those set back up for you. Um, and get more citations for your business. So again, this is you know, something that the, the citations you've got don't change, um, but occasionally they'll need updating. And also it's, it's always good to add to them. So once every six months, once every year, just go on and get a handful more, find some more. And again, if you just Google good citation websites or good listings websites for coaching businesses or whatever, you'll get a whole long list of them. They're easy to find. And become a trusted authority. The more places that you exist around the internet, the more Google will recognize your website as having authority and as a being you know, trustworthy because you're, you're everywhere in your industry. You're all over the internet talking about what you do. And so the stuff that you're saying on your website must be reliable and must be good. So we will rank you better and therefore we'll give you more traffic. So everything feeds in to everything else that you're doing. So your plan of action. Research your keywords. Well, we've done that because you've got your keyword and your competitor analysis. Um, I'll, I'll let you go through that in a little bit more detail and look at some of the competitors that I've put in there. But um, it, it's fairly straightforward. And if obviously you've got any questions, let me know. Um, structure your website. So we're going to work out now what site map you want what keywords are going to correspond to that. And then you can work out in within that site structure what does each of these pages need to contain? Start a blog. I know you've already written a blog, but I have done you a content calendar now. Um, I've done you two a month to start with. Uh, if, okay. you, if, if you need more, we can fill that in more. If two a month is too much, that's fine. If you want to wait until after we've done 
the um, the better blogging training, then absolutely, you know, that's fine as well. But what I've done is I've tied these in with your keywords, but they're all long tail keywords. Um, but I've also tied some of them in with some of the days that are happening. So that, you know, World Health Day, how can wellness coaching improve my health? Some of them are variations as well. So I've interchanged personal and wellness life as well, because they are interchangeable in terms of the algorithms. If you put one in, you get results for the other ones. So Google thinks they're all roughly the same thing. So I do think it's important throughout your blogs and your content to just vary those keywords as well. I know I've put personal coaching as your main keyword, but variations are wellness coach, life coach, all the rest of it. Um, so yeah, so have a look at these, see what you think about them. The thing about your content calendar, and again, we're going to content calendar more um, when we do better blogging, but it's always flexible. So if you look at one of these and go, God, that, I don't know what to write about that, that sounds awful. Even if it's tied to a day, we can put it in for next year and you can write something else now. So a lot of a lot of the first stage of writing a blog is going to be about getting that base content. So asking those basic questions: what is coaching? You know, how much does it cost? What does it involve? All the rest of it. Get that base content because that gives us stuff to link to when we're doing the later stuff. And then go down the uh, you know we can go really niche and, and do case studies and all the rest of it. So I've done your six months. Have a look at it. See what you think. If you've got any questions, obviously, let me know. If you hate some of them, let me know. If you really wanted to write about something else, let me know. But the key thing is your blog should be your way of asking and answering all of those questions. So it's it's okay. all about writing out what you do. Um, Optimise your website. We can't do that yet because there's no point doing that until your new website's live. And then backlinks, again, as I say, let's worry about those further down the line and i'll put yes. that in the summary at the end of your audit as well you know uh, social media email newsletters and backlinks let's worry about those later but just start thinking about them because they will fall into your general sort of blogging plan and yeah. content plan for your website so it's good to have it in the back of your mind of okay what what am i really good at writing articles about what can i write for somebody else and where else you know when you're having conversations at conferences and networking and stuff who could you tap up for a back link? Okay. And then final, final, final thing, and I promise we're finished. Um, th there's no final thing. So persevere, learn, adapt, and succeed. Use your analytics in the back end of your website. When you get your new website, we will put Google Analytics and Google Search Console on there so that we can track all of this data in much more detail and, yeah. and just use it to, to learn. Use your analytics in your social media. What type of content are people enjoying? Talk to your customers, ask them what are the questions you want them answering. You know, use all of that feedback that you get to keep improving your website. It should never be finished. So it's just about adding and learning and adapting and going. And you're not all of this that I tell you now and that I tell you over the next two sessions, you're not going to remember it all. You're just not. And and some of it's going to go way over your head. And some of it you'll remember in six months and realize shit, I haven't been doing that. But it doesn't matter. It, you know, it's just about making those little steps, starting to do each thing a little bit better, mm. and you'll master it. You absolutely will. So I know it's okay. terrifying, but it isn't. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Rachel. My gosh, that was a lot of information, but it was also yeah. really good. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. That's um, 